Good evening, everyone. My name is Gunnar. This is Craft Beer Blab. And as always, right next to me here on the, I don't know what we side it is. Gunnar for a second. And then right there. Jonah. Oh, can, you... Oh, can you see him? I can. Oh. Are we having technical issues again? Uh, Dan, hit refresh maybe on your browser. Oh, okay. So it says. Is he on audio only? No, it says, it says make sure. Hmm. Because I can see him on my end. And you can hear him? <laughs> yeah. yeah hit, hit, hit refresh, maybe? All right, I'll try it. Hey, Dan K from uh, Wisconsin. Are you able to hear me okay and see me? Uh, I, I got you loud and cool on my okay. end. So I'm really, really In case there's this. Now I can see you. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, so this is Craft Beer Blab, and uh, my awesome co-host, Jonah, is right here on the side of me. Today, we are talking to Dan from Regrained. Hey, everybody. The, some awesome-looking bars that use spent grains. Um, and so today, we'll, we'll kind of just jump right into it, because I know that you got um, somewhere that you may have to be in a little bit, so, so we'll try to keep this quick for you and then we can uh, continue talking afterwards um, about it but so regrain tell us tell us uh, tell us about it yeah so we're essentially trying to change the conception of, of spent grain in um, specifically in urban cities so we're in San Francisco we partner with the craft breweries here there's now more breweries than there are neighborhoods in the city of San Francisco wow. um, they're making great beer they're doing it often um, but essentially beer has this food waste problem that no one really talks about. The stuff that, it, even beer, the grain is used for the sugars, of course, um, for anyone who's, who's made beer before. Um, and what's left behind is all the protein and the fiber, which actually makes for delicious eating. So we, we got our start as home brewers, just shocked at how much grain we would use just to make five gallons of beer. And it right. literally, we didn't even have a compost bin. So it felt like we were tossing, um, you know, like, 15 pounds of oatmeal into the garbage. And we thought to ourselves, hey, there's got to be a better way. Um, and started thinking a little bit bigger than that. And now we, we're working with, we're in a commercial kitchen and we're working with um, craft breweries. And we're, truth, I mean, truthfully, we're barely making a dent in even what you know a single brewery uh, would go through in a week. I mean, there's just a lot of grain that's used for beer. Right. So we've got these bars, but we, our company is, is focused on finding you know, making all kinds of recipes um, using this grain and you know partnering with other companies who are gonna, who are gonna make make food and really introducing this as a as a new sustainable ingredient in our food system awesome nice. awesome amazing now I heard of Good. home brewers in the past doing uh, spent grain breads mm -hmm. uh, I mean obviously a bar is different than a bread um, but did you consider bread or? I mean yeah, yeah. So bread was our first product. Um, we were, and we we thought we were really clever because we called it Bruin bread, and we were UCLA Bruins. Um, and we that was that was exactly what we did because we we turned to the homebrew community um, to figure out what other people were doing with their grain. This was right after I got into all grain brewing. You know, moved up from from extract, so it went from having you know a pound or two of grain after a brew day to having fifteen. 20 pounds, sometimes even more. We like to make, you know, we were, we were in college. We like to make some strong beer, um, <laughs> which meant a lot of grain. Right. And so, yeah, we, we started making bread, uh, which I'd never made bread before. My buddy had um, and started just selling it to friends, kind of with the goal being, hey, if we can make enough money to plow back the profits into buying more ingredients to make more beer, like thumbs up. That's great. Right. Um, and then as we started to realize that we were on to maybe something bigger, um, we moved away from bread just because, have you ever made bread before, either of you? Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, I have, yes. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's great, um, but it takes a long time, right? You gotta not only mix all the ingredients and whatnot, but you have to let it rise, and then you bake it, and it's incredibly delicious, and then the next day it's not fresh bread anymore. Right. So in terms of like starting a business where we could have a lot of, you know, making, being, Putting the grain in something that uh, you know we could we could do a lot of, and that we could sell individually to people, and kind of grow grow from that. Um, right. We we made that pivot, but we 
would like to return to bread and other more fresh baked goods once uh, you know it makes more more sense. Nice, excellent. Nice. That's a, that's an awesome. I mean, that's an awesome concept. It's a, it's amazing. You know, I was just looking at your site. It's like you're you're working with um, you, you have three brewery partners. It's like Magnolia Brewing, Twenty First Amendment, and Triple Voodoo. Yeah, you ever have any of this? I, I, I can say that Twenty First Amendment. Yeah, no, I, I'm a uh, we, yeah. over here yonder on the east coast. I don't think you get that lot. Right. Maybe I think, does. Yeah, I mean, distribute beer distribution is a whole thing, right? I think Twenty One A has some distribution across the country. Magnolia is like if you come to visit San Francisco, it's a great, great spot to go. Yeah. Um, they've got they're one of the older, older breweries in the city. They've got one on on Haight Street. Um, Make some awesome beer. They have some casks and, and whatnot, and nice. uh, and the Triple Voodoo is a newer one, um, and they're just great people. And it's close to our bakery, so that that's uh, that's great. Right, yeah, that works. That works out. <laughs> that yeah. Works out. Nice. Now you guys recently did a crowdfunding campaign. When was it? That was like in November, was it? We did, yeah. So November was when we launched it, and it was I think we did we did a forty day campaign. Um, and on a platform called Barn Raiser, so it's like crowdfunding, but it was focused on sustainable food and agriculture. So like really good fit from a mission standpoint to what we're all about. Okay. And that was all too. We basically spent the last. I mean, we've been doing this for a few years, but didn't move into a. We were a cottage organization, which basically means like our home kitchen was certified to make these bars and right. sell them at farmers markets and whatnot. And we wanted to to grow, so we got into a shared kitchen space and spent the year kind of figuring out how. What people liked about their our bars, you know, what buyers liked about them, what right. you know, where there might be some room for improvement, and basically have it all these changes we wanted to make. But you know, if you're for anyone who's in the and any business that involves packaging knows, uh, packaging is expensive. There's high minimums, and uh, right. so to do that, we collected basically pre-orders and sure. you know, sold some other extra little goodies to uh, to raise that money. Nice. Right. You know, Excellent. one of the, one of the things I think that you know, I don't know. I'm sure you you know, everybody that's not in the bubble of where you're at, it gives you all these great entrepreneurial ideas. But um, Gunnar and myself, we're we're avid cyclists, and I know that obviously, yeah. cyclists and you know, micro brew go hand in hand. Yeah. And of course, totally. being on the West and bars, yeah, <laughs> bars, yeah. You know, I mean, as you can see, we we yeah. have no problem. But um, what, one of the things. Uh, I'm a huge events guy, and I know that, like, you know, the pre-registration swag bags, um, mm -hmm. things like that are, are always something that I look forward to at, at some of the bigger events anyway. I mean, have you considered, you know, maybe talking to event promoters and, and maybe, you know, throwing samples into the pre-registration? Yeah, maybe? Especially, especially with the new recipe. And I'm, I'm actually a big, psych, big cyclist myself. Um, and so I, I mean, I bring these on all my rides, and a lot of my friends do too. Um, so that's that's definitely something that we'd like to get into, especially once we enter into a broader distribution and people can like actually go and you know buy the bars. Although people could buy them on online, but cyclists are an awesome overlap of people who you know love to eat food that tastes good and that's good for you that'll keep you going, but also like care about the environment. And there's also, of course, that huge overlap with the craft beer community. So. Awesome. You know, that's that's the world we come from too, and we're we're all about it. Awesome. Hey Dan, thanks for showing up. How you doing, my man? Good to see you tonight. Thanks for tuning in to Craft Beer Blab. What's going on? Fantastic. Thanks uh for having me again. And I'm I'm super excited to have these guys on on the, the blab here. And I did a little reading about um the use of spent grains today because it's I'm a not super hearing anything, by the way. I don't know if I'm no. let's see. I hear you fine, Dan. Yeah? Yeah, Dan. Oh. You, you're good, Dan. I can see you. Can you hear me? Me, Dan, or the other Dan? Uh, we'll have to go Dan B and Dan, Dan B. I can see you. I can see you. Okay. So I can't hear anything Dan B is saying. Should uh, I refresh again? Yeah, maybe try to refresh again. Yep. Yep. Okay. Could be your signal. Sorry. No, sorry, sorry, guys. No worries. No worries. No worries. No worries. No worries. But yeah, no, the, the spent grain thing is amazing. I mean, it's like it's like 10%. I, I couldn't be blown away by, by that, um, you know, that whole concept. And it's amazing. Whoa, sorry about that. But uh, interestingly enough. Well, hi, Nicole. Woody, nice to see you on here, as well as Red Flag Dan. Nice to see you on here. Hey, Nicole. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. And Edwina B, BB. Yeah. 
Oh, nice to see you on here too. Wait. Yeah, Edwina, what's going on? BB Barber Mom. Hello. Hello. Okay. Dan from Marie Green is back in. Uh, Dan B, you want to say something and see if he hears you? Can you hear me Maybe this time, Dan? For me. Maybe you guys can repeat, or I can just keep refreshing if you want. You know, I can I can ask the question in the, the chat window, and you guys can just repeat it. I'll, I'll just type it in and mute myself. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Uh, I can hear Jonah and Gunnar, but I can't hear Dan B. Oh, okay. Dan B. Well, you know, that's, that's one of the things about Blab is it's, it's buggy at times. I mean, yeah. yeah. They're, they they got little issues going on every once in a while. So, uh, Joan and I could hear them, but uh, yeah. for what reason? So, yeah, go ahead and, and type in your your question, Dan. Yeah, sorry about that, Dan. It was a cool format. It is. It's a nice way to get like a a, a group discussion going. Um, and basically by the end of the night on our show, it ends up being a party. Uh, sometimes I bow out a little early, but nice. it continues on as long as people are in. Yeah. Okay. There's Dan's question. How do you deal with the husks from the spent grain while making new bars? We actually don't, I mean, some of our, we are playing around with making flowers and things like that, but our bars actually just have the, the grain in its whole form. Um, it's not, you know, hundred percent of the bar is not grain we use other ingredients like like oats and puffed brown rice and things like that to, to play with the texture uh, but we really want and we have like our packaging be clear too because we really want people to, to see this grain and see that it's that it's food and see what it is rather than processing it into some other some other form so right. yeah we don't we don't we we deal with it by just using it kind of like you would bran maybe it's, it's super fibrous and has some protein uh Certainly makes for a hearty, a hearty cereal bar. Nice. Now, would you consider the bars a nutrition bar or a snack bar, or uh, you know, I, I don't know how well to answer the question. You know, yeah, yeah, it's always a tough, tough question. We're, I think we're still figuring that out because there's nothing really quite like like these bars. Um, you know, they're. So they're not super caloric, um, which, you know, if you're an athlete, sometimes you want more calories, right? Uh, they're, they're like around the stout bars, I think 140 calories, the IPA is like around 130, and they've got three, like three grams of protein, so they're not a high protein bar. They've, they've certainly got plenty of fiber. Um, you know, they do have some, some sugar, but they're not a Snickers bar. So I don't know. I mean, I eat them all day if I'm like skiing or, or biking or just, you know, hanging out at the at the desk um so yeah i would just say they're i guess a snack bar but it's like snack food that's not you know overly processed and, and bad for you right right better no. better for you snacks i mean i i was just asking because you tend to look at at least for myself when i'm looking at at different bars and i just tried some bars last week and uh you know it, it is hard to classify and then from a, an athletic Point of view, sometimes the classifications helps because I'm not necessarily going to take a, a protein bar on a quick, uh, high intensity ride, mm -hmm. an hour and a half uh, sprint work or something. Yeah. And that, that bar, I may take a gel or, or a, a more right. something car like or something with caffeine, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was just curious as, as to what what you guys considered it and. and you know, yeah, for me, I, I like them during during exercise. You know, they're certainly not a, not a recovery bar. Um, and yeah, oh, there's a question coming in. Yep. Um, People already asked, are there only two flavors? There are currently two flavors. Yeah, we've got our IPA and our stout. You know, they're named named after the beers where we get the pale and the and the dark grain. Uh, the stout bar has got you know we bring out those roasted notes with chocolate and coffee. And IPA has got doesn't taste like an IPA because there's no hops, but it's got honey and, and cinnamon. Um, that one's actually my, my favorite. We're coming out, we should be coming out with another flavor this year. Um, and also, you know, like I was kind of mentioning in the beginning of the show, we're not going to be just a bar company. Um, so, you know, you can expect probably our fourth, our fourth product to be something that's actually not, not a bar at all. Okay. And Nicole's also asking if you're going to come out with a vegan option. Yes. Great question. So the, um, the new stout actually is vegan friendly. So we got, one of the things that we did when we did the crowdfunding was get egg out of the recipe. 
um, just in general was good for a lot of reasons. And the new stout bar also doesn't have honey. So that, um, that uh, makes that bar vegan. Nice. Yeah. And then we've got, we've got Ross. Right, do I dry it? Can you hear me right now? Dry the grain. Just curious. Yeah, I got you, Dan. I got audio. It's good. Hey, Ross. Thanks for tuning in. Ross had a question. He said, "I did your regrain on my show. Thanks for send, sending me them." Oh, oh nice. Tama is in the house. <coughs> cool. Yeah, I remember. Remember sending you those. We got we got the new ones coming out too. So we'll have to send you send you some of those when uh. Yeah, Ross is I'm ready. Uh, my audio apparently is poopy, according to Nicole. So hang on. <laughs> Could have just misspelled yeah. Hoppy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seriously, I don't. I know I have poopy, poopy audio. Yeah. Well, no, sometimes that audio is poopy. Yes. <laughs> See? Seriously, That's hang on. Let me try that again. Right, awesome. Any, okay. Any better? You like keyboards? Yeah. Nice. Red right? play. play. Yeah. Yeah. You always. Always got to get that dig in for your yeah. pores. Good, good thing. A good thing Eric's not here. We're good. I, I'm off. I'm off the hook for something. Apparently, here uh -huh. flying, flying helicopters or skiing or something. I don't know, but that sounds... is, audio, is the audio any better on uh, both both ends of things? Is it good? It's still kind of. Um, it's still kind of uh, poppy, I guess, or poopy. Still bad. Everyone else is good. Yeah. <laughs> still bad. It's still bad. Get a whiteboard uh, or something. Yeah. Seriously. Sorry. Now, I have a question. So you mentioned, uh, so there's the IPA and there's the stout. Now, are there other flavors going to be coming out? Or what um, or what other products do you have maybe on the horizon here? Yeah, so one of the things that we're going to be doing um, that we're releasing exclusively first to the people who backed our crowdfunding is a cookie mix. So it'll be like, uh, we're not going to be making packaged cookies. You know, there's um, nothing quite like a fresh baked cookie, right? So we want people to be able to make their own eat beer cookies at, at home. So we'll provide everything they need except for the wet ingredients, um, you know, along with some instructions. So that's something that we'll do. And then we're also toying with um, some other types of some products that are complete complete departure from from, uh, from bars. Oh, okay. And cookies, yeah. Like, um, well, I guess it's not a complete departure, but things like, like cereals and you know there's there's just a, there's a lot that we want to that we want to use this this grain for um, and also other kinds of, of mixes um, yeah, so we took awesome. you know just like, yeah so think of like any kind of quick bread that you would maybe buy at like Trader Joe's um, you know we can we can do things like that with this uh, this healthy sustainable beer related ingredient uh, yes Nicole we are in San Francisco can we can we sprinkle hops on? Yeah, the hop heads want that. You know, like I want like a hop candy bar, uh, and you know I think that could be interesting. Um, we yeah we don't currently add any any hops to it. We probably won't honestly because most people other than people like like us right here uh, yeah. don't want to don't want to eat hops. Um, but it's a it's a fun idea. Oh yeah. Oh. So really, you're using the grains, the spent grains, as almost any other type of, of grain, like you said, like oats, and like uh, you know, and just using that as as the ingredient. Yeah, and we're building recipes that that highlight that. You know, so like I mentioned with the the current bars, they we don't even mill the grain or anything. We just we're just like here's here's the grain. This is this was already used to make beer, um, and it's not done yet. Like it still has more to give you. Now, do you do you dry it out beforehand, or do you get it like from the mash still? Yeah, so we we actually go to the brewery as they're bailing out, um, or like right right before with our own. We got food grade containers. It's super important with if anyone who's ever been around a brewery when they're bailing out grain or has made beer before. Like the issue with this stuff is that it is wet and it is hot, um, and so it spoils quickly. So right. we pick it up in food grid containers, and we, we take it to our facility where we, we put it through a drying process. And then, uh, do we use a specific, specific brewer? Which yeah. yeah, so right now we work with uh, 21st Amendment, um, Triple Voodoo, and Magnolia primarily in San Francisco. Uh, bar would have a different taste. Yeah, so 
a little bit. It's more so different depending on if it's light, you know, pale grain or dark grain, um, because most of the sugars are taken from. Um, and yeah, Ross, that sounds good. Um, because most of the sugar, it's not as there is the flavor actually of the grain isn't what you would expect, you know, from like malt. It's actually got more of a nutty flavor to it. Um, so there is a bit of a different taste, especially like depending on the brewery, depending on their efficiency, you know, maybe there's, there's more sugars than, than in others. So that is something as we, as we grow, we're going to have to get, uh, figure out some ways to be really consistent around, um, the grain. And we, we do have some, some ideas there, but, uh, well, the, most the actual of the flavor of the grain itself, the bars actually mostly just taste like the other stuff that we, that we mix it with. It's more, it's, it's great for the, it's got that nutty texture to it. And then it's also the, the nutrition that's a, it's a healthful ingredient right nice nice so let's see here I, I, I was just curious doesn't most most of the sugars get burned off during the mash process prior to the grains being finished uh brewing because i i was under the understanding that most of the sugar in the grain itself is already um, gone Someone's at the end of the process. Oh, of course, I'll just <laughs> I'll just drop off at this point. Well, so uh, Dan Blomberg was asking. So he said uh, the way he understands it is that uh, the sugar is burned out in the mash, and so um, I think what he was getting at is how much uh, I guess of that flavor or that that sugar um, is left in it. Yeah, so not much of the sugar, and maybe about 10% of the sugar is left in the grain. You know, ideally, these breweries, the more efficient they are at extracting those sugars, um, actually, the less grain they can use to make the same you know, original gravity of the beer, right? So um, it varies a little bit. And it's, it looks like a four loco. <laughs> yeah. Is that a four is, loco? Bro. Nice. Drug is real. <laughs> We're going surly furious tonight here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I drank some. Uh, have you ever heard of I I L I? I L I. Yes. From I uh, drank a lot of that yesterday, but you know how that expensive as shit. Yeah. No. So are you from Florida then? Georgia. Georgia. Okay. So close by. Nice. Awesome. No, uh, I've heard things about I L I. So that that's actually one of the beers on my my to try list. It's pretty good, uh, man. Yeah. I like a lot of IPAs. Though. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too, definitely. Uh, love IPAs. Uh, also love a good stout every once in a while, and uh, you know. So, uh, so, how are you doing, Hayden? Is it Hayden? Yes, Hayden, doing pretty good, Hayden. man. Awesome, awesome. Chill. Uh, so we're talking with uh, with Regrained. This is Dan from Regrained. He makes uh, these bars um, out of spent grain from the breweries. Do you have any questions for him tonight? Bars, what do you mean? Like, uh, think like a granola bar or a power bar. The fuck? Uh, yeah. <laughs> make out of spent green. You yeah. get drunk off of it? Spent no. green. Hey, that's our, Hayden, that's our number one question. And half the people, when they ask me that, you know, I, I can tell, you know, want that answer to be yes. And the other half, I can tell, <laughs> like, kind of hesitant, like, can I feed this to my kids? No, there's yeah. no, there's no alcohol. I mean, alcohol and beer comes from the sugar that's taken from the grain that then gets fermented um, when you add in the yeast, right? So, yeah. you know, even if we were to add in beer for flavor, which would be a pretty expensive ingredient, but like, let's say we were to do that and bake it off, you know, the, the alcohol would be would be baked off. So, yeah, uh, yeah. eat beer is more of a more of a lifestyle, almost of a like eat this to get drunk. Probably would actually help you if you were drunk to like sober up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, Ross is uh, Dan Ross is indicating if you, if you soak a cookie in beer, it works. So apparently, it's like a, a hangover bar. Hangover bar, nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very no, nice. No. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of things we could do. This is like the first blab I've been in where everybody's from the United States. Yeah, you do get a lot of um, a lot of uh, overseas people from uh, the Middle East and uh, sometimes Asia. On some of the blabs, so yeah. And yeah. I confused as hell when I say Georgia. Though. Where's that at? Seriously. Right. Well, isn't isn't Georgia also a um, Georgia the country? <laughs> yeah, there's the country in uh, the nice. Russian states, I think. Eastern Bloc. <laughs> yes, the Eastern. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hey guys, this has been a lot, a ton of fun. Thank you for having me on here. I, I do have to jump off though. Um, but anyone who wants to be in touch, I mean, we're we're at Regrand on on Twitter, <laughs> and you can. I, I'm Dan at Regrand.com. Super easy to get in touch. Happy to um, chat with whoever wants to reach out. Excellent. I hit you with the follow awesome. button. Thank you. Right so, yeah, thank follow you, to all your friends. Good stuff. Yeah. Help us get huge. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Talk to you. Take it easy, man. Thank you. All right, so we got another open seat here. If anyone wants to jump back in, uh, sorry, Dan Blomberg, we didn't get a chance to ask the uh, glute, glute Paula theme to his bars. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe he needs oh. to have a four loco blab. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, four loco. <laughs> you you never heard four- a, a four loco go? That's what I'm drinking on, and it's fourteen percent. Holy cow, fourteen percent. Only Tastes like one. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll get you messed up real quick. Yeah, they're oh. rough. They're rough, man, but it, you can't beat $2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's inexpensive, yeah. That's a good one. It's oh. nice bun, bro. I got Thanks, one, too. You can't, see, you can't see mine, though. <laughs> and, and Gunner and you guys, it's uh, the, what, what I was asking is it's called uh, glutathione. It's... Um, it's something that that apparently helps with hangovers, and it was mentioned on the Joe Rogan podcast with um, a Doctor Gordon. So, huh? Oh, I admire your look so much. That's what I want. I want the beard like that, but I can't. I can't grow a beard. I got the bun already, but it's it's t- it's tiny too. <laughs> You're young. It's good, man. Twenty two, right. bro. It'll get there. It'll get there with time. <laughs> So one thing I wanted to bring up tonight while uh, after, because usually we start the show with, with uh, our local business and our, our, you know, hot topics. Um, And last week's show, I had uh, promised to put everyone that that, uh, tweeted the show out and joined the mail list and, or joined the uh, Facebook group that I would give out a pair of these socks, the Surly Brewing Twin Six socks. (laughs) That's cool. So uh, we can, <laughs> let me see here. I made a spreadsheet. Let me get that up here. And we can do our drawing to see who won. Are they long socks? They're uh, cycling size. So I think they're probably four inch cups yeah. or whatever. Hell yeah. Uh, Damn, I so wish I would have got in on this. Yeah, you <laughs> should have come in last week. We <laughs> So there was a, a total of 16 entries last week. Um, and let me see if I can get a screenshot of it here. And da, 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 da. <laughs> well, I guess I can't get a screenshot on screen. But uh, so anyway, so there's there's uh, 16 uh, entries in. And so I will do a random or hey, we have an idea, Jonah. Are you able to bring up random.org? Uh, let's try right now. Random.org. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. I got it. Uh, it's loading. 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 I don't know. Maybe it's just like it. I mean, I got... Okay. Please wait. Oh. <laughs> uh, man. I, I don't know. It might wait. Retrieving product page. Good Lord. I don't know. I've I've got it up, Gunner. If you want, okay. well, if you want to do a, a random generator, minimum number one, maximum number sixteen. I've got number seven. Number seven on my spreadsheet is at Rush Miller Foundation from Sharon on Blab. Ross, I think he called it, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I think he might have. So, no, no, not Ross, Rush Miller. That's Eric. Oh, That's Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little close. Yeah, and unfortunately, he's not on tonight, but we will have to get in touch with him on uh, Twitter and let him know Eric's work tonight isn't here. Yeah, well, and he's come by a couple other times when he has been working. So, <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah. you guys seen Deadpool? I haven't seen it yet. I Don't tell me anything about it because oh, I want to see it. it. All I got to say is it's awesome, man. Just see, see it. it today. Just see it. Nice. No, yeah, I'm excited to, to, to watch it. Um, I watched it bootleg as hell. 
bootleg. <laughs> 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 illegal thing going on. That quality was terrible, bro. Right. Well, I can imagine. People was eating popcorn beside the camera and shit. <laughs> And then <laughs> people walking in front of it. It's <laughs> bad. Oh, man. Nice. Nice. They're knocking the door. <laughs> Ross is funny. <laughs> so, let's see. Uh, well, there, I, I only had really kind of another one other hop topic to bring up. Um, and that is something that I read recently that, you know, and there's two sides to the story. Uh some people are saying that we're in this craft beer bubble and that, you know, the market's going to pop and people are going to jump out. <laughs> and uh, we got other people that are, that are saying, no, we're not in a bubble. Pop um, the beer bubble. <laughs> yeah. so, I, I don't really care. I'll drink like mostly anything. I'm, I'm not, I, if it's beer, I love beer just all around. That's all that matters. Nice. No. <laughs> not necessarily just to be drunk or whatever, but oh, well, just, yeah. I love beer. I but mean, um, you and Tommy Crowder would get along very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another one, another one of our, another one of our usual cast characters is not here tonight. So apparently, this crap here plan is off character because we don't have a usual, usual suspects in the house. But he's hmm. he's usually taken back like a giant baseball bat of Budweiser. I don't know. That's a good question. Where is Tommy K? Yeah, where's Tommy? We'll have to we'll have to give him a hard time tomorrow. Right, exactly. Well, so what do you guys think? Uh, you think there's a so this article that I just posted up um, is talking about uh, this guy from uh, Beverage Dynamics. I guess he does a lot of business with uh, in the I guess hospitality industry as far as like beers and bars and that type of thing and so he you know his, his big quote is that 60 percent of craft beer basically sucks mm -hmm. and so that that's yeah. one of his his things of saying that we're in we're in this bubble because you know everybody's jumping in and, and building this business and then uh you know it's eventually in a crash uh, Red Flag Dances does, doesn't even a TV show he does. He's got a TV show called Bar Rescue. And okay. um, John Taffer, it's, I, I, I don't know the channel it's on off the top of my head, but he he is, I think, onto something there because the, the market is almost oversaturated with craft beer to the, to the point where there, there are going to be a lot of craft beers that exist today that we – that just won't exist in three years. And, and that's, that's the nature of any growing market like craft beer. It's a growing young market, but it's getting to that point where I think within the next three years, we're going to peak out. Right. Pensacola. <laughs> Lucky thing. Hey, do you, do you guys think Yingling is a craft beer? That's one of my favorites too. I think it is. I think it's still considered a craft beer. And it's like cheap. So that's cool. I don't like, like the prices on a lot of craft beer. That's about the only thing wrong with them. Right. Yeah. They're, but they're, you know, they're hand. That's the whole thing with, uh, with smaller breweries. They don't have the buying power of the larger breweries. So yeah. the, the grains, like what Lee Grain was talking about, um, and hops and all that type of stuff, it costs money. And when you can only buy it in a smaller quantity, it costs a lot more. Yeah. Dan Clowen says, I think had it not been for prohibition, we would have reached this level of progress sooner. It wouldn't seem like a bubble. Only the big breweries were able to survive. Yeah, that's right. That's the prohibition. It was the bigger companies that were able to kind of push their money. I think, I think the craft beer right now is, is more or less, I think, the equivalent of like the snowboard industry. I mean, I think if you guys remember, I don't know, if you were snow sports folks, but I mean, so many snowboard companies, and I think it was just a matter of time, you know, in terms of like now all of a sudden, you know, there went from being a multitude of companies to a handful of solid companies. And, and I, and I, we, you know, we talk about craft beer and the joke that an L and I throw back and forth is indie beer. Apparently now they're, you know, now they're calling, they can't call it craft beer because apparently craft beer is like, you know, too, you know, taboo. And now it's, it's, it's indie beer. Shock top, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, in all, in all seriousness, like, I, I think you're right, though. I mean, there, there's definitely a good number of beers that are calling themselves craft beers that are not craft beers. I mean, obviously, you know, 
said there there's a there's a distinction with what what classifies <laughs> that beer as a craft beer you know but right. you know but i think that the reality of it is you know, you're right is, is you know i think when people talk about pricing yeah i mean i i, I agree i mean you know we you know we you know a couple of weeks ago you know we jokingly had a, a show about you know 40s and, and cheap beers and it was rough but anyway um, yeah. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I mean there, there's you no, know, there's definitely some okay inexpensive beers. I guess if, if I could word it that way. Yeah. Um, my point to you is, is generally speaking, I, I know, and you brought up a good point. Is is when I'm going to my my local package store, it's like I I, I have kind of like I hate to say like uh, you know, using the gas analogy, like I pay the pump price. Like I know you know what I'm going to be paying for. Um, when I go to buy beer and, and sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's not cheap. And, you know, I think, excuse me, I think that when, um, we did, um, and, and <laughs> we, we, we did like a Russian Imperial stout, I mean, right. I don't know, my, my God, I think I, I, think I, I, I don't know how much I paid for like a four pack of Russian Imperial stout. It was great. You know, but at the same time, <clears> I was like, my God, I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to spend that much for four beers every time I go off for beer. So, you know, I mean, right. I, I, I think that that is, you know, if I was going to say what is what is the big downfall of people like looking at like craft beers, like their thing, I think pricing is a lot of it. So, um, you know, I, I guess that's just my two cents. Hey, Nicole, good to see you. Thanks. For, thanks hey. For Hello. Hey, so I wanted to get in on this whole uh, craft beer bubble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the thing, <laughs> the the thing, and see, I'm I'm sounding lispy because I got new Invisaligns in my in my mouth, so I'm going to be a little lispy. Oh well. <laughs> um, you have certain states though that have a monopoly to be able to keep the craft um, beer industry going. For example, he brought up a um, what is it, Hayden? Yeah. Okay. Hayden. He, he brought up a great example. So originally, um, I'm from Pennsylvania, and mm -hmm. Yang Yangling, you go to anywhere in in the uh, eastern part of Pennsylvania, and you order a lager, and they're going to give you Yangling. That's that's just a norm there. Yeah. However, now I live in Louisiana, and in Louisiana, a lot of um, the beer around here is Abita. Abita is the big the big name around here. And Abita has a stake in the, the state government here. So then they keep certain beers out of the state. So it, for example, Yangling. <laughs> Yangling, was, Yangling was just able to be sold now in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, but it is not permitted to be sold in Louisiana. Wow. Um, which other large kind of um, beer companies like that, that have a stake in Abita's territory, they're able to keep that out of our state. However, they're not scared to be in competition with smaller breweries. Like um, there's a there's Bayou Tesh down here. Uh, there's a couple breweries in Shreveport, Louisiana, that are so tiny they feel like, you know, they don't have a stake in anything against the Beta. Right. So they're fine with that. So it's it's keeping the small little breweries in Louisiana covered if right. they stay smaller than a Beta. Well, now that. That kind of leads me to, uh, so I recently read an article about uh, somebody, I guess a distributor somewhere on the East Coast, uh, got in trouble recently for, they called it pay, pay to play in uh, bars. So the distributor was paying bars to have tap lines dedicated to their specific beers. Um, and apparently they got it they got a pretty big fine they have to shut down for 30 days or something like that um and i guess it's against the law but i mean how can like abita say okay we're gonna keep yingling from coming in i mean you know wouldn't yingling be able to just kind of get if they wanted to be in that market wouldn't they be able to just do it or how uh, well that's that's like saying um gunner you're in minnesota correct right Okay, if I remember the laws in Minnesota, I'm a pharmacist. So if I remember the laws in Minnesota, you cannot have a large pharmacy in Minnesota. So like Walmart can't have a pharmacy in Minnesota, but you can have independent pharmacies in Minnesota. Is that correct? Um, I don't know because we got 
the final season in Walmart and Target and, and there's Walmart. certain kind of yeah, it, the maybe it's Montana. It's it's one of y'all northern states up there. <laughs> it's either it's Please. is it okay. Um uh gosh, it was just in the a uh, couple elections ago. But there's it's either Minnesota or Montana. I'm I'm sorry, I must I might have uh, messed it up. Yeah, but yeah. they have they um ruled out any kind of large pharmacies up there. So you only have independent. Well, there was an election going on to try to take that off the law books that, you know, Walmart, Walgreens, everybody can actually have a large pharmacy. And because they say that it would give better pricing to, to the patients. Right. However, it didn't go through in the election. So pretty much it's, it's going through government to be able to keep a business out of that state. Right. So it's the same thing with... <laughs> Is it funny? <laughs> nah, somebody running behind uh, Ross. This shit's cracking me up. It's a little cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ross, what, what did you want to get on here? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. So the setup, I'm not going to be able to keep my son quiet over there. He keeps running back and forth. Um, anyway, so I'll get this in. So as far as the bubble goes, here's the thing that I think people have to take into account because I think it's almost like, Everything isn't the same. So you can't go, oh, there's a real estate bubble. Look, that's going to be just like a financial bubble. And that's going to be just like every other bubble. And people think that, that the idea of this bubble is that it, it's just going to, it's going to have to pop. There's too many things. So therefore it has to pop. But in reality, I don't see that the same way with beer because the fact is when you go to a beer store and you see 200 bottles, the majority of the market, see the market determines whether it's a bubble or not. And so that hasn't been factored in. So when they look and they just don't know anything about beer and they're drinking a Coors Light and they go, oh, this has a cool label. Uh, it's got a skull on it. That's what's happening right now. And they're actually okay. It's an okay beer to them because they're drinking Coors Light. So I, I don't think that the amount of choices is creating a bubble in craft beer. That would only be true if everybody was a craft beer enthusiast at the top of the market. And then there were so many that there's no way the small ones could survive because they were making mediocre beer that nobody wanted. The fact is, is there's such a lag in adoption and and in demand for quality beer that the market is sitting that back there with Budweiser. So you're talking about a long time before they're going to shift over to be, uh, you know, pushed away by mediocre craft beers, which are already better than, you know, the macro beers. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I totally, I totally get get what you're saying. I totally get what what you're saying, Nicole. I mean, it, you know, here's here's the thing. And so I'm not in the beer industry, so you know, I'm probably wrong on a lot of accounts. Uh, I only go by what I read online. Um, but it seems like you know, there's there's both the the legal or the uh, political side of things, where you know the the laws vary in every state. Um, you know, here in Minnesota, we can't buy beer on, we can't buy alcohol on Sundays. It's only sold in, in, uh, liquor stores. Uh, you know, th there's all sorts of regulations, but now craft breweries are able to sell growlers on, on Sundays, which is amazing because everywhere you can't buy from anywhere else on Sunday. So in some ways that kind of favors the craft beer market for, at least for local breweries. So, you know, I can, run down to my local brewery and, and pick up a growler of something. Um, but then there's the whole three tier distribution and marketing side of things, which it sounds like Ross, you know, a little bit more about in that, you know, the, the big players are kind of uh, pushy, but yet there's still a lot of market out there for the small breweries to be able to survive. If, and, Maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it sounds like, well, if you make a good product, whether it's marketed well or whatnot, then, uh, you know, you, you'll be able to survive. But I think if you don't make a good product, maybe you won't be able to serve. I, you know, I don't know. Well, from our standpoint, from my standpoint, he's like playing a game right next to the microphone. Um, so I guess he laughs. Let's go. Shut up. My my side from the marketing standpoint, right? The fact is, is that we want, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. It does affect your business. If you make a mediocre product versus a great product. I mean, we want to have a great product. Okay. 
And Dan K says he was surprised to see a liquor store in the Mall of America. Nice. I didn't know they had a liquor store in the Mall of America. Of course, I don't go to the Mall of America. Where is the Mall of America at? Is it in That's Atlanta? The, it's in Min- Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, I thought it. There's something I mean, like that in Atlanta. There may be. I mean, big malls are kind of the big thing. But I mean, this Mall of America, it's huge. I don't, I actually don't like going there. Yeah. Red Flag Man says <laughs> Who does? Mall. You like craft beer. So why would you shop at, at a big old mall? <laughs> I know. Well, and, you know, you can, here's the thing, and I'll get off my soapbox, but so Mall of America, it's huge, but it's like there's four stories and every floor has at least like four old navies and four gaps. And yeah. and so I was like, well, why, why have a billion of the same stores? I want to, if I want to go someplace with a lot of selection, then I want a lot of selection. Dan Key. And apparently Minnesota law allows samples of liquor prior to purchase. This that should be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> that should probably be illegal. That's, That's all I do. <laughs> That's crazy. I another one of that, and uh, anyone who sees me review knows I will drink a thimble of it anyway, mostly for the review. That's my buddy who always drinks the rest. So I, I go to a place that has like, oh, they'll give me a one ounce sample, and I'm like, two ounce sample. I'm like, cool. Uh, I got twenty taps. Let me get one of those, one of those, one of those. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Gunner, what's your favorite beer? Uh, one of my favorite I'm drinking tonight is uh, local beer, Surly Furious. Oh, Never see, I thought it said Slurry. Oh, Slurry. Okay. Slurry. Slurry, Slurry uh, sounds better. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorites. Of course, I like other ones, too. Uh, I think the I ILI is my favorite, definitely. I did like your idea about having kind of like, instead of uh, the, the March Madness bracket, talk about having like beer brackets. Yeah, so that's a that's an I idea, like that idea coming up with, and I figure I gotta get I gotta get the bracket built here pretty soon. So I don't know if anyone has an idea of how to choose the beers to put into like a sixteen bracket thing, and then we could go through every week and say, okay, uh, you know, this against this, and this against this, and and what do you guys think? Can we do this after Lent? <laughs> Your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I want the 16 beers, like, lined up, and so I can actually try them, like, in the entire bracket. But unfortunately, I gave up beer for Lent, and I'm I'm, I'm struggling here because I'm on beer blend. <laughs> Stephen Colbert had the funniest thing on Lent. I saw it, like, a couple of years ago or something. I can't even remember what it was. I think he was – I think his thing he was going to give up was – he was giving up Lent for Lent or something, or it was along that. It reversed it. <laughs> it was hilarious. He had a whole skit on it. You'll have to Google it. Nice. Uh, but now, now I'm going to be really upset if you do it next week. Right. Um, well, yeah. uh, well, when is that? No. Yeah, I think we got a couple of, of weeks until March, but uh, so Lent doesn't end until Easter, right? So that's yeah. like, <laughs> that's way past March. So it can't be like March Madness. Well, we got like, hold on, it was Sunday. What's today? <laughs> I have to like count how many, how many days I haven't had alcohol already. We got like 12 days. <laughs> no, we have more than 12 days. It's 40 days of Lent. <laughs> so Lent just started, well, Mardi Gras was last week. So Ash Wednesday was Wednesday. Today's Tuesday. So tomorrow it'll be seven days. Seven days only. <laughs> it probably seven. feels like a lot longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Seven days. Oof. I know. I start sweating and get the shakes. Yeah. So I got a month yet. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to be able to do it. Yeah. I'll have somebody else do it. And... Oh, nice. It. No, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll at least be able to address the ones that I've already had. There you because go. Because that's. That's going to be the issue is because you guys drink like a lot of Minnesota beer and a lot of beers that are up north. And of course, I drink a lot of the ones that are in Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi. Well, and see, that's what's going to be the the tough thing is coming up with it. I mean, I I don't know exactly how we can do it because because beer is such a regional thing. So uh, Jonah's in Rochester, New York, and 
you know, we got people in California, we got people in Colorado. Uh, Ross, you're what in the Pacific Northwest, right? So everyone's going to be able to get beers that, uh, you know, they could be the most amazing thing, you know, Pliny or, or uh, Kitty Topper or whatever. And then nobody else is going to be able to get them. And so we can't necessarily say, okay, well, in a group discussion, which one wins? Uh, right. So I don't know. Well, I don't know. Jonah has a great idea. If we could get into like a beer trade, yes. then I can hit all the, because I go back and forth for work. I go back and forth between Jackson, Mississippi and Louisiana. So I, there's a ton of breweries like in between there. So I can always grab like a bunch from a couple different breweries. And actually um, there's a brewery in Jackson that my friend, her and her husband actually owns called Lucky Town Brewery. And it's actually in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so I can get a ton from them and then a ton in like Shreveport, New Orleans and that. Well, and so speaking of beer trades, I had set up a Facebook group um, that I figured would be kind of a safe place to be able to trade <laughs> with other people, um, you know, without it, like completely open or, you know, some random person on, on Twitter or Craigslist. I mean, I guess, yeah, Craigslist, right? I know people do it on Reddit a lot. Um, but so that's the link to the, the Facebook uh, Craft Beer Blab group. Uh, you know, if we get a bunch of people on there from different areas, then we can uh, go ahead and, and start coordinating trades to get this going. I'll try some ILIs. Yeah, no. Well, and see, my, uh, my wife is out of town in Florida, and supposedly she's going to be bringing me back a couple of ILIs. So. Dude, they're um, awesome, bro. That's what I hear. Well, and they also make uh, Cigar City. They also make a, a stout, I think. I can't remember the name. Um, what is it called? Let me look them up real fast. I'm trying to find it, man. I can't find it on here. Craft yeah. beer. Don't what is it, a fun. page? Yeah, it's a group. It's a Facebook group. Do you think it's case sensitive? Uh, I don't know. It might be. I just got on there. Um, yeah, and hint, hint. I'll make sure to check out the laws of what states can uh, you can send over the borders or through yeah. the mail. Well, here's here's my understanding, and I think uh, Jonah um, knows this too. So, as long as you don't use the U.S. Postal Service, you're safe on a personal level to send beer to someone else. Um, and he also recommends calling it cooking supplies. Yes. Cooking yes. supplies. <laughs> so as long as you have cooking supplies. That's cool. Uh, then you can, you can personally send beer to someone else. Okay, Ross. Yes, we're making beer cheese. Yeah. <laughs> beer <laughs> cheese and beer bread. Your ingredients. So uh, what else? You know. We're sending supplies to regrain. Yeah. So they can make us a personal bar of our own. Right. <laughs> Beer cheese. <laughs> Beer cheese. That, that should start trending on, on Twitter somehow. <laughs> I bet that's gross, man. What, beer cheese? I'm sure it would probably be good. Oh, no, there is a, you got to look oh, um, no. that, that uh, Tasty that has like a bunch of different recipes. And they did um, like brats in beer and you like steam it on your grill. And then, you know, after it's done, you you know, you take the brats out and then use all the liquid that was left to actually make the beer cheese. I don't know. It looked kind of tasty. Oh. <laughs> I'd give that a try. Yeah. I would give that a try. Okay. Well, now that I'm on the group, I'll, I'll find the recipe and I'll send it to you. Excellent. But well, yes, the, the beer tray would, would, would be a great idea because right. I, I, I know my husband would be into it because, I mean, we pretty much <clears throat> go to a ton of different places and always are trying something new at a brewery. Um, but, yeah, it would be hard for me to get stuff from you guys and, of course, probably hard for you to get stuff down here. Right, right. Well, now I've I've had Abita. Is that how you say it? Abita? Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. it up here. Um, but I actually wasn't too impressed. I mean, I had like, a, I think it was like a mixed pack. There was like an apricot one and Ew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't do fruit in beer. <laughs> Hell no. That's that's not my thing. Right. Um 
there is a beta amber is going to be like your typical amber ale that would be in comparison an exact almost comparison to like a yangling lager um mm -hmm. so that that is like why i said there's like a huge competition there i like um, the yangling summer wheat oh see i don't i don't like wheats either it's just <laughs> I, I am like the darker the better to me oh, um, for real. i mean i can drink a light one but um yeah. No, they have a um, another one called Andy Gator that's not too bad. Uh, another one, Purple Haze. Those are like the top three sellers, pretty Purple much. Purple Haze. Yeah, I've seen that one in the stores before. Yeah. I've never had it though. Does it have a pyramid on it or something like that? I think they all have a pyramid. I think that's kind of their logo. Like yeah. the A. The A is like pronounced. I don't know if I have. I'm trying to think if we have any in the fridge right now or not. Well, we got another. Oh. I don't know if. Uh, yeah, what happened to Jonah? Or if anyone else wants to jump in before Jonah does. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get that audio taken care of. Right. <laughs> um, but no, there's um there is a brewery in Shreveport. Um Shreveport. one of the best one of the best beers I've ever had. Um it was called Old Man Joy. No, Shreveport, Louisiana. It was called no. Old Man Joy. And what they did is they bought um old Pappy Van Winkle barrels. And uh, they aged a stout in those Pappy barrels. Oh. One one of the best beers I've ever had. Pretty pricey, um, but it was very, very limited. Um, but yes, that was absolutely amazing. But yeah, yeah, they don't have it right now. What I find though is sometimes when, when beers are aged in, in barrels, and I guess it depends on the barrels, um, what was in them before like some bourbon barrel beers tend to be a little too bourbon like i mean they just get i mean well i guess part of it is the the alcohol content if it's a if it's a high abv and then it's also mm -hmm. bourbon <laughs> to me it just comes across as i mean i might as well just drink some bourbon yeah beer so <laughs> which, really which yeah that, that usually that usually happens and that's um um, I've actually said it before, uh, Bourbon County, which is from Goose Island, now in Bev, um, Goose Island, but um, they sell once a year on Black Friday, they sell um, Bourbon County, and it is aged in bourbon barrels. However, if you look on the label, it's in very, very, very tiny little letters, it says best to be aged for five years. Oh. And mind you, I pay a lot of money for a case of that. It's like 144 bucks for a case. So I'm not going to wait five years for each one of those cases. So, you know, it's a treat, you know, like a, a, you know, a couple here and there. So maybe like one every four months or five months or something, but you notice as it ages, it gets a totally different taste. So as why you were, you were saying like in the very beginning, it might have a like really, really harsh taste to you in the very beginning. Cause it's like, you know, 14, 13% hitting you. Right. Um, but it kind of mellows out as it ages. No, yeah. Well, and I kind of, uh, I, so I'm, I'm sort of experimenting. I don't have anything, I think, bourbon or barrel aged. Um, but like Surly Darkness is, a, is one that a lot of people recommend aging. And so I have some, for, not from this year, but from last year and the year before, um, just sitting and hopefully aging correctly. You know, it's hard to tell if, if you got it right or not. Um, but so that's my, my aging experiment, hopefully. And I did taste one fresh, uh, and it was good. Mm. It'd be kind of interesting to see how it compares. Of course, you know, you go in by memory or even if you write down like a, a log or something, it's hard to, to say, okay, well, Hey, this is, you know, it's got this going on. You can obviously tell if, if the alcohol's mellowed and it's not as hot, but other flavors it's kind of, okay, well. Maybe it did taste like this. Maybe it didn't. I think um, sometimes that I, uh, one of our friends actually does it. He has, um, if you ever, like, if you were ever teaching anything, mm -hmm. um, when you make a test, you make it very, you don't make it subjective. It's very objective. So he keeps a log and he has a grading scale on that log. Like what you were saying, like um, it's hard to remember those kind of things. He writes everything down and he actually says, okay, from one to 10, one tastes like this, two tastes like that. He actually makes it ahead of time. 
Okay. And is very descriptive in what one through 10 actually is. And so right. he can take this little log with him when he goes to breweries and actually rate it there by that objective log that he made. Right. No, I get it. I, and I've actually considered, because uh, I, I mean, I work in, in graphic design as my day job. And so I've considered making, and I know that there's other ones out there, like some sort of um, scale and different different flavors and different um, aspects that, that you're looking for uh, in you know, doing either a one to five or one to 10 scale and then uh, doing that. Then I end up with this huge sheet of, of okay. Now, now, <laughs> so I keep going back and forth of, of how to do it. Um, red flag Dan. So how will I know if this tastes better by aging it if I've never tasted it unaged? Well, that, that's that's what I was saying is that I I don't like aging it until five years. I like to actually like know how it's aging. Right. Oh, crap, my laptop's dying. Um. So that's why I said I kind of. I kind of have one here or there. Oh, my dogs are like laying all over the cords. Uh, so I have one here or there so I can actually rate it. And then I'll know how it's tasting out the pages. Right. So you can, you, you have something to compare against. So you basically like if you buy two bottles, you, you have one right away, you rate that. And then later when you, when you're done aging or when you're ready to try the other one, then you go ahead and, and rate that, and then you can compare it objectively, side by side. That's awesome. No, I think uh, that would be the way to go. So we are after nine o'clock. I am going to have to actually end this, so I'm going to pause recording. Uh, Dan K says that takes some discipline to not drink a beer literally for five years. Yeah, no. Hey, try forty days for Lent. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's hard enough when you have something in the fridge and you're like, oh, I'm going to wait until, you know, this weekend. But thank you guys so much for joining Craft Beer Blab. I do appreciate it. Um, tune in next week. We will have uh, – this is going to be another awesome show, and hopefully they'll stick around for the whole hour. Um, but Roundtable Hops, they're from Minnesota. Go ahead and follow the link. You can uh, subscribe to the show there. Um, as well as there's an event on the on the Facebook group. And also, if you join the newsletter, I will send out a reminder next Tuesday um, or before next Tuesday. That's the newsletter link. Go ahead and join that. And we'll send you a reminder that we're having another show, as well as the guest and any other news that we have. Um, again, Roundtable Hops, they are, they're doing hydroponic indoor hop farming. And so they just did a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and they're looking to spread this, I guess, all over. So we'll talk to them. Thanks a lot. I will talk to you guys later. Aloha.